Well, welcome to today's video. It is Monday the 6th of April. Now, when this virus was first discovered, we didn't know very much about the COVID-19 coronavirus. But as time is going on, more and more clever people around the world are studying it and we're getting a much better understanding of it. And today's talk here is about transmission characteristics of this virus. And when you've watched today's video, it'll probably help you understand why this virus has spread so quickly. And we're going to be doing a little bit of science, and I understand not everyone wants to do that. So I'm going to give you the bottom line straight away. So the bottom line is that when we breathe out, we can be transmitting droplets for two meters, seven feet, six or seven feet. When people cough, then the droplets can go out for five or six meters. That's 19 feet. And when we sneeze, they can go out for seven to eight meters. That's 23 to 26 feet. So this means that this is spreading much further in the air than we had previously thought. So let me just illustrate this. Um, right, so here am I. Um, now, when I, when I breathe out, you see what happens is when you breathe out, you breathe out a lot of different sized droplets and they form a bit of a cloud and they can kind of swirl around like this. And with normal breathing, that can extend out to two meters. Now, not all of the particles will go out to two meters. Some will drop out before we get to that point and they can form on surfaces. So there we have a box or a table or something. And uh, the particles can go on top of that and then we can touch that and contaminate ourselves with that. So it's about two meters for ordinary breathing. But coughing, it goes up to five or six metres. So when you cough, you get this swirling cloud that can go out much further than that from a cough. And this diagram is roughly to scale. And again, smaller droplets can drop out containing the virus and contaminate other surfaces that they might come into uh, contact with. But if you sneeze, then it can go out for seven to eight meters. This is quite incredible, which is actually off the end of my end of my scale there. And again, things can drop out and people could be potentially contaminated further away. So so that's that's part of what we're talking about today. And uh, the other thing, just to give you the bottom line before you, if you want to skip this video, is that the old fashioned way of saying, well, an infection is either aerosol or droplet really no longer applies. It turns out that's based on old fashioned thinking and that there can be aerosolization of droplets containing the virus and they can potentially spread in air currents such as air conditioning systems or as a result of fans. So that's kind of the bottom line on this, um, meaning that there's more respiratory spread than we thought, meaning that surfaces could be contaminated several metres away from an infected person, and uh, meaning that people could be infected who are further away than we thought. So we're saying two metres for, uh, two, two, two metres for um, ordinary breathing. So I didn't mean to show you that, that's for the end. It's that one. <laughs> two metres for ordinary breathing. Um, what did we say? Um, for, for coughing, uh, five or six metres, so that's up to about here for coughing. And sneezing, um, sneezing even further. So breathing, coughing, sneezing, transmissibility range. Now, I think that's the main thing about this video, but if you want the details, I'm going to give it to you now. So this is based on a study from um, New England Journal of Medicine. No, it's... Um, no, no, it's not. It's a uh, JAMA, J Journal of the American Medical Association. Sorry, and it's by the by, by this pr professor uh, L Lydia. I'm not quite sure how she pronounces her name. Anyway, so th so that's the reference, and I will put this link in here for you. Now I can't show you this video. Um, from, at least I don't think I can. It's I think it's a copyright thing. But if you click on that link that I'll paste below, you've got these truly disgusting videos of people coughing and sneezing and you see all these droplets coming out and it's quite 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 revolting when you see it on their video so well worth the click to watch the way that these things emanate out and spread out from the breath and the coughing and the sneezing 
of people. And on the video, actually, uh, they use a healthy person to do this coughing and sneezing. So the, 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 um, you still get all the droplets, but of course they won't have the virus in. The big difference is when you have the virus, when you're shedding the virus into your respiratory tract, these viral particles will be in the droplets. So this paper is called um, Turbulent Gas Cloud and Respiratory Pathogen Emissions. <laughs> so what it's saying is that <clears throat> when we breathe out, we get actually gas clouds like this, these swirly clouds. So it's not individual droplets. It's a, it's a bit of a cloud that we breathe out. And path means disease and gen means beginning. So the pathogen is the virus itself. And uh, there's potential implications for reducing transmission of COVID-19. And it also interestingly tells us why it might have spread so quickly and also tells us why it might have spread in confined areas such as ships and aeroplanes. So this was the data. Now sneezing, this is incredible. When you sneeze, the uh, material, the droplets can come out at 10 to 30 meters per second. So like 10 meters per second would be about 35 feet per second up to about 95, even 100 feet per second. So 10 to 30 meters per second. So it's coming out really fast and it can go for seven to eight meters, which is 23 to 26 feet. Coughing, it can be spread out for five to six meters, which is 19 feet. And breathing, it can be two meters or up to seven feet. So further than we thought before. So masks, now, no, right, this is interesting. So with a mask, let me just, so with, with a mask, what happens is if there's a mask in front of your face there, then you're going to breathe on the mask and that's going to interrupt the forward momentum. So it's not going to go from me to you. It's going to interrupt the forward momentum. It's not going to reduce the number of viruses that we eject out when we cough, sneeze or breathe, but they're going to go round the side and they're going to fall onto our clothes and they're going to fall onto the ground much nearer. So what, what the thinking is here is, and this is reflected in new recommendations in Austria, where they're insisting on mask wearing going to supermarkets from today. New advice from the Centre for Disease Control, the practice in Taiwan, the practice in China, um, where, where mask wearing has been compulsory. So the main reason it seems now for wearing masks is not to protect me from your infection but protect you from my infection so the infected person is protecting those around them by wearing the mask now this is slightly different in the care situation if you're looking after a sick person then you should wear a mask as well because there's likely to be a high load of viral particles in the air but then you need a tight fitting correct mask the uh, the loose fitting mask or the the uh, the standard surgical masks won't be effective you're going to need a more sophisticated type of mask which may or may not be available but the new american um, recommendation from center for disease control does recommend just covering your mouth and again this makes sense because if you cover your mouth it's going to take away the momentum of the cough or the sneeze or the breathe which is propelling this material um, progressively further forward yeah so it's, it's going to so it's, it's, it's like a barrier and it's stopping this material from being propelled further forward. The mask will last for a limited amount of time and when it gets wet, it will be less effective. So the consensus seems to be coming down to really very much on the side of wearing masks is good, not to protect me, but to stop me infecting other people. And of course, given that we don't know who's got this disease at the moment, then the rationale for people wearing masks in public areas such as supermarkets, I would say, is now there. That rationale is now there. Now, the background of this is very interesting. Um, what, we, what, what this paper says is that the dichotomous uh, classification between large versus small droplets. In other words, previous work said that um, droplets that you breathe out are either tiny small ones like that or the great big ones like this. So an infection that is in the very small particles could be aerosolized. The one that's in the bigger particles is droplet infection. That's been the traditional classification. So droplets would be the large particles. Aerosolized transmission would be the small particles. And initially it was thought that the COVID-19 was just the, uh, the droplet infection. 
I remember Dr. Tedros on, on a news conference about, oh, I can't remember, four or five weeks ago now, probably six weeks ago, say, saying that the virus, he said the virus is, is, is in the air. And then his mate next to him, uh, Dr. Ryan, nudged him and, and Dr. Tedros corrected himself at the end. And he said it's not airborne as in paratroopers. Well, actually, it turns out that it probably is airborne as in paratroopers because it can move in air currents. So to say a disease is droplet or aerosolized is simplistic and actually based on data from the 1930s, it turns out. So it's well out of date. So arbitrary droplet diameter cutoffs. So what people have said in the past is it's droplet if it's larger than five microns, micrometers in diameter, or some people said no, 10. So it was an arbitrary, arbitrary size difference, really. So people had been saying that greater than five or 10, take your pick, micrometers is droplet, smaller than that is aerosolized. But this work has shown that in any given exhalation, cough or sneeze, there's going to be particles that are relatively huge, particles that are smaller, particles that are smaller, smaller, and ones that are absolutely tiny. There's going to be a continuum in particle size. It's not one or the other. And the virus can, we believe, be spread in all of these, even the smallest particles, because the viruses themselves, of course, are absolutely minuscule. So this means host to host transmission as droplets or aerosols. So the host is one person who has it. I host the virus if I have it. Funny way to put it. And that can spread to another non-infected person who is a potential host. So we're talking about person to person, host to host transmission. So rapid international spread of COVID-19 using arbitrary droplet size cutoffs may not be accurate. So the thinking that we had dividing, thinking this was droplet, when in actual fact, so if, if that's like droplet there, and that's aerosolized there, what we're saying is there's a continuum between the two. It's not one or the other. And the COVID-19 is probably somewhere like that. It, it has characteristics of both modalities of transmission. So this does explain the rapid international transmission uh, that we have been seeing, making it all the more easy to see with the retrospectoscope, with hindsight that it was absolutely not helpful to have flights carrying on flying out of China in the early days as the World Health Organization advocated. Possible possibly contributing to the ineffectiveness of some procedures used to limit the spread of respiratory disease. So we've been working on the wrong assumptions to some extent. And I believe that before this, the World Health Organization recommendations was that carers should be a meter away. And even the Center for Disease Control before this recommended that it should be two meters away. We can now see that that was not far enough. Not far enough. This new work is showing that. It's showing this spread. And do watch the video because it does show this much more uh, graphically than I've, than I've drawn it. <laughs> so the recent work, um, exhalation, sneezes and coughs, they, they, they project out muco. So muco is the mucus that comes from the respiratory tract. And then it picks up a load of saliva from the mouth. Quite revolting. So muco salivary droplets, droplets of mucus and saliva. And it's a multi-phase turbulent gas cloud. What that means is it's not just one linear projection of pattern like that. It's kind of turbulent and all over the place. It's got different components within the, within the cloud, within the puff. So it's a multi-phase turbulent gas cloud. Continuum of droplet sizes from absolute minuscule to positively huge. I mean, you know this, if you sneeze on something, you can wipe the surface down. You can see droplets on the surface, but the smaller ones you can't see. Now, it was thought that droplets couldn't survive for long, but because the droplets are in a cloud, so if you imagine that's one droplet in there, then that's going to evaporate maybe within a few seconds in the atmosphere. But the droplet's in a cloud, so it's not that. It's got other droplets round about it. And they've got other droplets round about them. So this greatly slows the rate of evaporation. 
because it's in a it's in a cluster it's in, it's in a it's in a cloud so the evaporation can take much longer than was previously thought and the droplets can survive for minutes so the structure of the droplet can be maintained for minutes in these clouds not for seconds as was once thought and these have a payload of pathogen bearing droplets makes it sound like a bomber or something doesn't it a payload of pathogen bearing droplets so what this is saying is that there's a droplet there like that so that's a droplet of water and the viruses are in that so a droplet might be carrying thousands or millions of these tiny viral particles that can go directly into someone else's mouth mucous membranes or nose or go onto a surface or an object that someone else can then touch and contaminate their mucous membranes with and it's a moist <clears throat> it's a hot moist gas cloud with its own physical characteristics now how far it goes will depend on the uh, the ambient ambient just means roundabout as the ambient environment the temperature the humidity and the airflow so the thought the thing that jumped out at me was airflow there so through central heating systems through uh, air conditioning systems in flows from one room to another through fans inside buildings we've got the possibility of spread and of course the poorer ventilated the area the more spread there can be now residual or droplet nuclei so what the, what this is saying is that when you, you have the the droplet there like that and you have uh, the viruses uh, in there now when the water evaporates it will lose the water and you'll be left with a bit of mucus a bit of dried out saliva the other chemicals that are in those and the viral particles in a very small nuclei like that so to blow that little nuclei up there what we'll be looking at is what hasn't evaporated from the saliva and the uh, the mucus but within that there would be viral particles now these whole droplet these whole um, nuclei of the pre so that was a huge droplet there was a huge droplet you know spreading out for feet you know, on this scale way out here so around surrounding that but now it's dried out to that and these can because they're very light they're very small they can be suspended in the air for hours the implications of this are huge now we did look at a study a few weeks ago from china that suggested that these particles could be suspended in the air for three hours so this research means that that is quite possible indeed probable now what this means is if you're in a room if, if, if there's a sick room so someone's sick in the room so if someone's in the room and uh, th 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 they're ill and they're they're going to be shedding this virus then the virus is going to be on the clothes it's going to be on the bed clothes it's going to be on the the skin it's going to be on the surfaces round about them so to reduce the aerosolization of the virus from a sick person it's good if the sick person wears a mask especially when someone's in visiting them and the other thing is because these hang in the air because these uh, viral nuclei the the, the uh, droplet nuclei hang in the air um, we can dilute them with good ventilation so we need to ventilate sick rooms now I hate it when people go on about the old days but when I was a young staff nurse in the old days <laughs> we used to have wards called nightingale wards and there were huge wards you had beds all up and down one side one huge room and massive windows you could open these huge sass windows so we'd tidy up in the morning open these huge sass windows and the whole ward would go cold with fresh air in about two minutes then the patients had complained it was cold and we'd shut them all but the point is it gave a complete change of the air in the in the ward but now a lot of modern hospital wards you can't even open the windows They're dependent on air systems in other words the conditions for such infections to spread are potentially in place purely because we lack ventilation but at home where you can ventilate open the windows dilute dilute these in the air but bear in mind it does mean that a sick room where a nurse uh, a sick person is being nursed at home will be contaminated 
Another reason why it's very important within the home as far as possible to keep the door shut of someone who's been nursed in a sick room so that these don't diffuse out into the air in the rest of the house. So really important practical applications here. Now, um, a study in China from 2020, um, the COVID-19 virus was found in ventilation systems of hospital rooms of infected people. So infected people were in a room, the ventilation systems of those rooms, the virus was found completely consistent with this, uh, with, with, with Lydia's modern, um, is, it, is it Lydia? I've forgotten her name now. What's her name? Um, yeah, L L L Lydia's modern. She's a professor. She's a proper scientist with, with, with a modern, with this latest data, completely consistent. So this is always, this is always encouraging when data from the field agrees with data from the, the, the laboratory. It makes it more likely to be correct. Science is about multiple collaboration. Truth is multiple collaborations. The more time we can collaborate something, the more likely it is to be true. Now, this is, this is quite incredible, actually. That apparently, the World Health Organization had just been saying a meter from a sick person. Oh, dear. I do hope they've changed that now. And even the Center for Disease Control was saying uh, six feet. And they've changed that now and advocated that people wear masks in public in case they're infected. So... Um, the, the, Lydia is a scientist. She's um, very scientific. So she says, may underestimate the distance. I think that's a, I think she's being very conservative there. She says it may underestimate the distance. So uh, mask uh, efficacy as a source of control depends on the ability of the mask to trap or alter high momentum gas clouds. So this is the thing. It needs to stop the momentum. So when that's coming out there at some great speed, the mass can block that and block the momentum of the particles and uh, is going to stop the spread of its pathogenic payload. So fascinating article. It means that in governments and international bodies have underestimated the degree to which um, this virus can be transmitted in the air. Um, but we had suspected this for some time based on early Chinese transmission characteristics. And uh, this work certainly seems to confirm that. So the practical applications for healthcare are there. Even more than two metres, there can still be spread of the infection. And we need for personal protective equipment, even at greater distances. Uh, implications for nursing the patient in a sick room that that will be contaminated and just something keep, as simple as keeping windows open and keeping sick rooms well ventilated from the room to the fresh air in the outside world is, is a good thing but that's not always possible in confined environments so in confined environments spread is going to be much more likely than open environments especially the more people that are in the confined environment now that that uh, right, that's the end of this talk. Now, serious implications there, though. Now, w what I gave you a, a flash of before that I didn't intend to do at the time was just <laughs> I got this picture from uh, from Matt in France, and I just thought it was a really good picture. So he's drawn a picture of me um, <laughs> doing this talk with the animations and things on there. So um, I just thought that was well worth sharing. I just wish I was artistic. <laughs>